At last, I finally can teach the executive branch of the United States of America. Y'all thought Corona would stop me, but no. I am dedicated. I haven't even reached my final form yet. I'm about to trend all right anywho. So, you know, before we left for break, we were talking about the three branches of government, how our Constitution establishes all three of them. Now, we spent a good chunk of time talking about the legislative branch. If you can't tell by the red circle that's in place right here, we're about to talk about the executive branch. But before we do that, just so you know, everything I talk about when it comes to the three branches of government comes straight from Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution. That means everything that I'm going to be talking about here is directly in Article 2 of the Constitution, primarily focusing on the executive branch. Now, before we dive into Article 2, just a bit of a review of Article 1. So, before we left off, we were talking about the legislative branch and how it's divided into two houses. You have one house, which is the House of Representatives. It's got 435 people in it. Uh, depending on your state, you might have one person, you might have 27 people. It just really depends. Uh, it's all based on population. And each representative serves for two years and then they're up for re-election. Now, the senators, on the other hand, there's two per state, meaning that there's 100 total, and they serve for six-year terms, but only a third of them are up for election every two years. In the House of Representatives, you got the leader, the Speaker of the House, who does all the things for the House of Representatives. That's Paul Ryan. He's not the Speaker of the House currently, but uh, you can voice your opinions on that through email. And then you have a president of the Senate who is Mike Pence right now. In the event of a 50-50 tie, the vice president breaks the tie. Otherwise, it really doesn't do a whole lot. The Senate pro tempore does. Now, to make a bill, there's pretty much four simple steps. First, somebody's got to have the idea. they got to write it down on a piece of paper. And a person in Congress has to present the bill. Then it's going to go to a committee where they'll discuss, analyze it, table it, kill it, whatever they decide to do with the bill. If it gets through committee, then it needs a majority of votes from both houses. Um, and then once it gets a majority amounts of votes, the president will sign it at that point. If he signs it, it becomes law. If he doesn't sign it, then, well, Congress can still override the president, but they need a lot more of a majority at that point. And that's the legislative branch in a nutshell, and that's honestly great and everything. But, like, in reality, what if I just don't want to follow the laws of Congress? Just like some people might not want to follow speed limits. Well, just like police officers are in charge of enforcing speed limits, who do you think is in charge of enforcing the laws that Congress creates? Well, that would be this guy. Now, before we get into a whole discussion about the President of the United States and whether you like him or dislike him and stuff like that, I'm just going to make it kind of clear at the beginning. You don't have to like the person in office. You don't have to like the previous person in office. You don't even have to like the first person in office. Nor do you have to agree with anything they say or do. However, at the end of the day, they're in charge of this ship that we're all on. We're in this giant titanic-sized boat called the United States, the president is the captain of that boat. And if you ultimately want them to fail, simultaneously you want yourself to fail at the same time, which 99% of people would agree is counterproductive. The 1% we pray for. And it's even biblical, guys. Like, looking in Romans specifically, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. You might notice there's something red right there. Uh, pretty much long story short, for the foreseeable future, I'm just going to put everything in red in my PowerPoints that you would normally write down in your notes. So, be sure you know the verse that justifies why we respect our leaders. Uh, also, side note, when it comes to this verse, Paul wrote this in Romans while he was in chains because of an emperor that didn't like Christians. Yet he was still saying to respect that emperor that put him in chains that didn't like Christians. The least you can do is respect our leaders. Now, the executive branch of government. Now, if I were to ask you to explain to a nine-year-old what the executive branch of government does, it's pretty short and sweet. 
They're responsible for executing or carrying out the laws that Congress makes. Take whatever Congress puts out and put it into action. So when it comes to the executive branch, it should just be this guy right here and his team and we're done, right? No, not quite. In fact, the executive branch employs the most amount of people in our federal government, about 4 million job positions in total, making it by far the largest of the three branches of government, at least when it comes to employment numbers. You might think that the legislative branch is a little bit bigger because we vote for a lot more people than the one person in the executive branch, but when it comes boiling down to like actual job positions, it's the executive branch that is the biggest. But before we get into talking about, like, the president, his powers, and stuff like that, let's talk about this house right here. Yeah, don't you wish you guys were in Washington, D.C. this year? This definitely happened. Anywho, the most famous house in the world, the White House, built in 1817, housing every president since James Monroe. Um, make sure you know the address of this world-famous house. I'm not going to be super specific if you get the zip code wrong, but please know that it's 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, that being said, though, what makes this house super, super special? I mean, it's not the original house. I mean, the original White House was built in 1800, and then it was burnt down in the, by the British in the War of 1812. Thanks, James Madison. The only president to not live in a White House of some sort was George Washington, FYI. Nor is it the White House the biggest house in the world. That belongs to the People's Palace in Romania. It's the heaviest building in the world. That building you're staring at right there is 99% marble. And it used to be the private home of a dictator, which last I checked was pronounced Ceausescu, but, you know, I'm open to be proven wrong. Yeah, this is the People's Palace in Romania. It's now their parliament building. Quite remarkable. And this used to be one person's house. One person lived in this house. Kind of a crazy person. Nor is it the most elegant house in the world. Although, truth be told, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Personally, I'd rather live in something like the Ritz-Carlton in Saudi Arabia. Uh, fun fact, that Ritz-Carlton in Saudi Arabia actually used to be a prison. Now it's one of the fanciest hotels in the world. Or if I was looking for something more historical, I'd look for like the Palace of Versailles, which if you have a building like this in the future when you become super successful, that is hashtag goals, and please invite me there. Please. And thank you. Plus, people get confused on what the building actually is. Like if I take a similar building and just posted a picture of it, you'd be like, oh, that's the White House. So I'm kind of curious, like, if you guys know which one is the actual White House. I mean, you could kind of look at those context clues, like looking at the picture on the right, that there are people staring at it, and there's a giant pointing thing in the back, but the reality is it's actually both the White House. It's just different depending on which side of the building you're looking at, whether it be the South Lawn or whatever. The importance of the White House is the symbolism it represents. The most powerful leader in the world goes into that house, and they only go there on a temporary lease of about four to eight years, give or take certain circumstances. Then a new person's brought in through free elections. The first time our world has ever seen a system like that, and that's why it's the world's most famous house. Not because it's the most elegant, not because it's the biggest or the heaviest or the most expensive to make. It's because here is the symbolism of freedom, right here, right now, the White House. Now, we're done for now. That's it for the PowerPoints for the first day.